about your lockdown experience? How's it been? Because you normally work from home anyway, don't you, Aime? Well, I mean, not really. Because <laughs> I do. <laughs> to be honest i i mean i i've spent so much time in america the last sort of six years and last year i was there like 15 times and so when i kind of during this period of actually sitting down and going yeah i don't work from home i i think i give the impression that i do but i don't really so it's been it's been kind of an interesting thing there's been huge parts of it that have been really wonderful and i think just like most times when in adversity the arts as a sort of culturally we do find ways of creating and and i think the idea if somebody had said to me years ago right well you need to write on zoom i'd have been like don't be ridiculous but actually i have i have probably had more output in this time because i've been writing you know i've been doing three sessions a day and my day tends to start about four because that's when america wakes up Nice. Um, so, you know, and so it's been, you know, it's not ideal, but at least it's happened. So that's all that I can say, really. And, you know, is it, so do you have, are, you, are there like writer's rooms then? Is that what it is? Are you sort of like with a group of writers or is it just you and a singer or how? It just depends. So I got, I've got into sort of patterns that I, I work with my friends, Jack and Coker in Sweden. We work on a Monday and then we bring an artist in. So an artist will be you know, will be in their room, in their house and Jack and Coke are in different um, rooms themselves because they're not together in Sweden. Um, and then I work with another group called Triangle Park in LA and they, three of them are in one studio living together and another one of them's away and again an artist comes in. And so it literally changes um, sort of day to day and then I'm writing a lot with Guy Chambers and we're just doing that literally kind of just him and I um, just bashing ideas out. So, you know, it's as close to a normal session as I normally would have. The only difference is I think that it's super functional. It's like two hours instead of six hours because you're not really hanging. You're just kind of going, right, let's get on with it. Yeah, because I think, you know, we've been rehearsing and filming some stuff and I can't go past an hour really. And, you know, an hour and a half rehearsing on Zoom is just, it just kills you really. I think it's really intense, isn't it? Yeah, and you have to, you have to compensate for the, the fact that there's a screen and so you're having to push so much more, you know, beyond yeah. that. And, and do you think it'll change things going forward? Do you think you will work in this way or do you think, oh no, I want to get back? I mean, I definitely want to get back, but I think what it's told me last year, I had to go to Nashville for two days to finish up something with Lady A, and I'll never do that again. If they, if somebody needs me to finish something, then I will do that via Zoom. And, you know, I had to finish like a bridge of a song with an artist the other night with a guy in LA. And again, that the, that's where we all just said, this is where we can do that. And I think there's no doubt with somebody that I know really, really well, then this could be a way forward, but you can't really beat the physical kind of connection. You can't read a vibe very easily on Zoom. And yeah. then I'm, you know me well enough, I feel all the gaps of silence anyway, let alone in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, <laughs> so it's just like, it doesn't do well for an ADHD person at all. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? You're thinking, sometimes I'll say something in meetings and I'm like, are they frozen? And they're like, no. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay. So there's nothing else to talk exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah, it's hard, yeah, that yeah. Is, yeah, I think that is a bit of a sort of a culture shock, really. So do you, how have you been with all the technical? Oh, I'm horrendous at all that. Horrendous. Right. So I, before this all happened, I worked with a young writer called Alex Stacey Lodes. And he lives in Philly and and he kind of travels a lot like I do, but I've known him since he was 12 and he's a whiz kid. And I just said, right, I've got a caravan at the bottom of the garden, you and your girlfriend move in. So he's been living here for three months and it's been perfect because in lots of ways he's got on sessions that perhaps he wouldn't have got on with me. And then he's been able to do kind of all the stuff that, because we've even like been recording, uh, we're doing like Luke Evans's album and Luke has been in Miami and we've been recording his vocals and Alex kind of takes over his computer and does it all and we just we got Luke a mic and we told him which one to get so all of that stuff it blows my mind and it makes me feel ancient because I'm kind of kind of look at the wonders <laughs> of technology because <laughs> I can't believe that we can do that 
are. Yeah, it is. So yeah, I'm horrendous, horrendous at it. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. And so how are you thinking, you know, you, like you've been working with loads of people like in the past year and um, Camilla Cabello and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, how is that, you know, when records are being released now, how do you feel about that being sort of remote from it? It's really hard. It's really, really hard. And I'm not going to lie that that's not something that you have to kind of, I have to navigate and I've had my wobbles because I think I'm very much someone who I like to have the goals and then say, right, that's coming out and that's coming out. And I was supposed to, you know, Jonas Brothers was supposed to be dropping sort of in, um, any minute and that's been pushed back. And um, and uh, Christina Perry, that was supposed to be coming out. That's been pushed back. So you have to kind of just accept some of it and just say, look, this is OK, because the rest of the world are going through bigger things here. And I think that quite rightly so, there's been a slight backlash against celebrity culture during this time because, you know, when people are sort of saying, you know, you're just, we're all in this together, it's arguably not particularly true if you're in, you know, the Caribbean on a yacht or whatever. And so I think that there's like, there's gonna be an appropriate time for like beautiful things to come out when people are really gonna need them. And so I've kind of managed to balance that by, by writing some music during this time that I feel will have some degree of importance in the world. I mean, who knows whether it will, but you know, yeah, I've just had to kind of turn the FOMO thing off in my head. Yeah. You know, that's been the worst thing. And do you think that, you know, you were saying about, um, like, cause you had, you had a tour um, booked and everything, didn't you? So. <laughs> the first time ever I'd sold tickets, Kayla. <laughs> Yeah, because we had tickets for that. So, uh, yeah. so I and mean, a lot of people were, like hugely disappointed and everything. But so, how did you cope with that? How was that? I mean, to be totally honest about it, I had this terrible Friday before, and when I look back on it now, I think we had no idea what was about to come. But where I had to sit, and it was basically I was given the choice because you know, arguably certain person in parliament wasn't making it very clear and so then it was like how what do I do here and I think what really in the end made me say I have to postpone it is that my mum couldn't come and and I you know this is probably the biggest tour I'll ever do and my mum has Parkinson's and I'm not someone now who's chasing some kind of solo career for anything other than to kind of enjoy this moment and say, this is quite cool, I'm 44 and people have, have found my music. So I, that really was the thing. I was like, I'm not gonna do these shows and my mum can't come. And, and if my mum can't come, that means there are lots of people's mums and lots of people that I'm gonna be asking to compromise. And so it was an easy decision to say, this isn't the right time. It wasn't easy to kind of go, oh you know it's not happening and but I profoundly believe it will happen and it will happen when it does happen I want it to be safe and I want everybody to enjoy it and however long that takes I just think that's the right thing to do you know And just, you know, looking at that, you know, being, you know, because you grew up in Bristol. Bristol, yeah. And so just going on how you became a songwriter. I know you've probably talked about this so many times. I don't mind at all. But I think for people who, especially the children that came to see I, The Storm, you know, and how that music, well, not just the children, you know, everybody who came to see it, the way the music really, really was so emotive in it. Um, and those lyrics, you know, it's just, I remember, you know, that first time Leading Me was sort of emailed over 
you know, I was like, oh my God, this is like, because it's just the thing that you have, that power that you have of just touching the nerve really on it. And so where does that all come from? You know, can you remember being, you know, in, in a primary school writing lyrics or, you know, how does it come yeah, from? You know, and I, I genuinely, like, with all sincerity, you know, have said many, many times that I feel like songwriting kind of saved my life. When I was young, I definitely had what would be called ADHD now. And I still believe I have got, you know, that because I, I you know, I, I, I feel like I ride a slight wave of my kind of, you know, my energies or whatever you want to call it without sounding too ridiculous. But you know what I mean? I think I, I think I have an excessive amount of energy anyway. And, and, um, and I... I do remember um, dad giving me like a goodbye yellow brick road and, and sort of thinking, this is, um, this is unbelievable that someone can do this. And I did end up meeting Elton like years, years later and saying, I've had this speech prepared since I was nine, but I do remember <laughs> kind of that, you know, I guess it's when any child suddenly realizes, wow, you can, you know, you can ride a horse for a living if you want to. So that was, the, there was a definite moment for me, but I know that, for me, it was about feeling unable to express myself in any other way. And the second I found that, and it was about the age of nine, that I would go and I'd write songs. And it used to irritate me because mum would say, go and write a song if I was in a kind of a bad mood. or, And, um, and I just remember the world making more sense. And, and at the time, um, Nelson Mandela, I remember sort of kind of hearing that song and understanding like a bit of what that was going on and being really like taken with this whole thing of like what do you mean someone's been put in prison because of the color of their skin and and so I wrote this song about Nelson Mandela and submitted it to a school competition and won the school competition so it kind of all started to and I do think you know my school kind of worked it out very quickly that I like to write songs so I'm sure I was hated in my school but they were I think because they would say right sing one of your songs before assembly as the kids come in and probably it it definitely started a whole thing for me where I and but the main answer really is I just it was the way I made sense of myself when I was young is in song form and do you when you're writing stuff now for like really famous people and things do you do you sometimes go back there do you have that sort of image um, of being like nine and yeah I mean I regularly have like I actually can't believe I'm doing this. Like I regularly have that and I hope it never goes. I, I think I'm too old getting, being successful when you're older means you don't truly believe it. <laughs> so it's that thing that I spend my whole life kind of going and I suppose thinking I can't believe it worked. And I think that's the one thing that I would say to anyone young and I, and I, that's kind of my mission now is to try, I, I haven't got superpowers. I just was someone who was born in a village with no connection to music and I just loved it. And I just, and, and so I didn't know the path I was gonna tread, but I knew that that was what I was meant to do. And, and, and I don't, and I think anyone in our field, that they started there, they, were, they didn't start with superpowers, do you know what I mean? And do you think, you know, that because, you, you toured a lot very early on. And do you think that's sort of the honing of the craft then? Yeah, I think it definitely contributed. I think it's always helped me have a bit more of an understanding of what it is to be a young artist and what, what it, it is, you know, what happens to try and get there. It also broke me a bit and made me realize that it wasn't what I wanted to do as the main job. And I think that that was quite an important thing for me because I think if I'd still had massive aspirations to be an artist, it would have been quite hard to have these amazing young kids come in that were like profoundly better than me and, and me kind of thinking, I wish it was me. I, the, that's all left me, but it's definitely informed how to write a song, how an audience responds, you know, how you, how you craft that thing. And it's so all of it, every failure and success has definitely contributed. And, you know, because we have, I was saying to you earlier on about, you know, we meet a lot of young people who are making decisions about going into the theatre industry primarily with us. But how do you, you know, 
music industry, I, from just talking to you, is far more competitive. You know, how do you, what, what, are the, what do you need to actually succeed in an industry like that? I mean, the, the most important thing above talent, above everything is tenacity and the ability to not give up because there is nobody that will tell you you're doing the right thing. You know, there is no one. And so, you know, you have to have that kind of inbuilt thing of, of accepting that you might be the only one that thinks you can do it for a while, which is pretty hard. And um, I've always said I was really lucky I had my husband who was my voice going, you can do it, because at times I don't know, but I do know. And it's, it's such a, a difficult one because I would never want to sound like preachy, but I think with music more than anything else, you can't have a plan B. So it's just got to be the only thing that you want to do. And, 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 you, and in a way, if you, if you could give it up, you might, but it won't give you up. So that, you know, you just have to say to yourself, however long this takes and whatever route, because it might not be the route you expect, you know, you're right. It's incredibly competitive to become an artist, but do you know what? Someone's got to do it. Every single year we have new people come through and who is to say, you know, when I met Ed, when he was 16, you know, he used to say to me, do you really think I'm going to make it? And I, I would say, yes, I really thought he was going to. And I think, you know, so why not, why not somebody else? Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, you know, I've, I think your industry and my industry, we live in the world of the ridiculous. We live in the world where we say we're going to make the impossible possible. And unless you believe that, don't do it. Because if you, if you kind of say to yourself, I want to get there really quickly, then yeah, <laughs> go do something else. But the journey will be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Don't by that. Yeah. And it's not good news for those living on the southeast of America. I got lost inside a hurricane. And I've been turned upside down, inside out, and back again. But all my world won't ever be the same. Now, if we just look at the system coming right on its rear end, it is going to cause you, all time. Is there, you know, do you have a plan? I know you said just then, you just said. There's no plan B. So yeah. I mean, I definitely don't have a plan B. Um, I definitely have a plan for the future because I, I feel that I'm, you know, I'm 44 and right now I think I've got a couple more years in me of chasing the kind of the pop thing. But I think arguably I'm going to get to a point where I want, I really, I've always said I really want to be happy with where I've got and be able to say what's a little bit what's next and I've become good friends with Diane Warren and she's always the, she's the person I've looked up to the most because I'm kind of like I want to be Diane you know who people still go to for songs but she doesn't have to chase stuff and and so yeah I mean you know I the storm kind of opened up a whole thing for me um and I'm you know writing a musical at the moment and have been for a couple of years and I've also got a project on the go with um, with the actress Rita Wilson um, and we're doing a show called Sound of a Woman which is kind of going to be like sort of vagina monologues for women of our age. I've always I said you know if you if you don't sneeze if you don't pee when you sneeze you can't come to the show <laughs> and, um, but yeah and I think maybe I, I think I've still got ambition I've still got lots of ambition but it's not I think I, I now just accept that really letting it be what it's going to be is probably the best thing because I could not have changed I couldn't have chosen how to go th this way you know I didn't decide yeah. I'm going to have a you know a big hit you know I'd have done it a lot sooner if I had <laughs> and um you know just talking about like it's funny that you know we just talking about like tenacity and things like that and it's, it's, it sort of does take us back to like, the storm really because that was the first yeah that was the first well I've never written a musical before you know never written a, you know and it sort of started from nothing but we had this sort of like this this girl that you know was basically tenacious and wanted to succeed and just sort of wouldn't be deterred and I think you know looking at her background and everything I think that it's really important that you know we've all got our issues our you know our sort of things that could hold us back. It's just seeing past that, isn't it, really? And yeah. I think, you know, with, especially with, 
um, the situation with theatre now at the moment, with so much uncertainty, um, I do, you know, I, I sort of turn an optimist really, but I do, you know, it will, it will survive it. It'll just of be in a form, you know, and I think that yeah. thing that you're saying about um, having a way to express yourself, that's, that's what's going to, and I think that is the, the key to it all really, is having that. My, you know, in my heart, I think that the process of creating will be reignited by this because essentially, okay, arguably maybe performances on a large scale are going to be hampered for a bit, but actually small groups of people getting together and having brilliant ideas isn't going to stop. And, you know, and this has been like the most crazy times, but you just think, well, look what happened after the war and look what happened, you know, you know, during the most, you know, during apartheid and the most amazing music and film and theatre came out of that. And, and so I do believe that, that there will be, you know, as awful as this sounds, there's a huge amount of creativity that comes from darkness, you know, and, and so I do think that although we don't know what it's going to look like, it will be something. There's no two ways about it. It will yeah. be something. Yeah. And how are, how are your children dealing with it, Amy? How I mean, it's been, you know, it's been like a, it's been a really interesting time. I think that as a parent is the hardest thing because you, you know, we all desperately just want our kids to be kids and live yeah. their lives. And you realize just how important social interaction and us all having separation from each other. I mean, I, again, I haven't had a shower in peace for three months. I think they say I've had a shower. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> but it, and I think so for myself, I know that um, it's been, you know, it's been tough, let alone what it is for them. But equally, I think, for them, there's been great things that have come out of it. We've yeah. got to spend loads of time together. We have like every Saturday, we have cinema Saturday. I've bought a big screen from Amazon and we sit in the garden and, and watch a film and, and we've talked and, you know, there's an awful lot of, of really positive things. But I also know that's because I live a privileged life and we have space. And, and, um, and I just keep saying that to the kids. Like we're so, so lucky. And, yeah. you know, yeah, I think because that's been really one of the, the things that like, we all eat together. Like, you yep. know, we never, ever sit down together and have food. And we do that now. They're the same as us. Yeah. Yes, it's like, it is those, those little, little things that cost nothing. Yeah. So have been so important. I think it does sort of, like I kept saying at the very beginning, it's like you just recalibrating. Um, which I think, yeah. you know. And we probably needed to. We all yeah, needed yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no right. doubt. Yeah. But that's been great, Amy. Thank you ever so much. No problem at all. That's really cool. No, no problem.